Hey, welcome back to Shotoku Tech. This is part two of the installing Open Media Vault on Raspberry Pi series. In the first part, we got all the way through installation of Raspbian and OMV, all the way up to logging into the web interface for the first time. Now we're going to finish up by opening the Getting Started with Open Media Vault guide and start out with the OMV initial configuration steps. So the initial configuration steps begin on page 29 of this Getting Started guide. So you log in as admin and the password is Open Media Vault. And again, that's the IP address that uh, you pick up from your router's DHCP client list. Here you want to make sure SSH login permit root login is on. Leave all the other settings the same. So we want to set up the network interface with the fixed IP address. And that needs to be outside the range of what is being passed out through DHCP. So we can reset the web administrator password, configure the system time. You can use a NTP server on the internet. You can change the host name of your Open Media Vault server. So let's get started. Admin, Open Media Vault. Remember, we haven't changed the password yet. So this is the dashboard view. And if you click home, it gets you to the various settings. You can also click that sidebar and expand that out. So we're going to go to system. We don't need to change anything in web administration. We do need to change the web administrator password. Okay, so I'm actually going to sign out now and then sign back in with the new password I just set. Okay, clicking on the home icon exposes all of the settings again. So we go to date time and we can see use NTP servers already configured. We're just going to set the time zone. It's a little confusing for me because I'm in Arizona, which is mountain standard time. We don't observe daylight savings time. I don't see the tick box here for enable daylight savings time. So I'm at a loss whether to choose Pacific time or mountain time. And when I choose mountain time, it's an hour ahead of where I'm at. So I actually go back and choose Pacific. Now, when you make configuration changes and have to apply them, this takes a really long time. So see if you can't make several changes within the same section at once before you do the update. In this case, there's nothing else to do, so we're just going to have to wait. Okay, so the change has gone through updating the configuration for date and time settings. Next, we're going to go to network and configure a fixed IP address. I'm going to leave the host name Raspberry Pi as it is. In the document, they say give it a domain name of local, so it would be raspberrypi.local would be the host name. So I'm selecting the interface, I'm editing the configuration, I'm changing the IPv4 from DHCP to static, and I'm going to give it a fixed address. Now the 192.168.1.26 is within the DHCP range, so I don't really want to be using a fixed IP address within the DHCP range, so I'm setting it outside of that to 226. My existing server 2008 media server is at 225, so I know 226 is available. The default gateway is my router. Subnet mask is a slash 24 or 255.255.255.0. I'm going to use my router as a DNS server. They recommend to configure public DNS servers, but DNS is working just fine. So there, we configure that IP address, and now we have to apply the configuration change. And again, this is going to take a really long time. Okay, so you can see here, now the update has occurred and I get an error in the web GUI because the IP address has changed. So now I need to log in to the new IP address, that 192.168.1.226. Again, you're going to want to know what the settings on your router are, the DHCP client range, etc. And we go ahead and log into that IP address that we set. There we go. So we log back in. Remember, we already reset the password. So we got to use the new password here. We've set the time service and we've configured a fixed IP address. 
So again, click on the home icon to expand out the various settings. I don't need anything else in the system section at this time. So now we're going to add a disk to our Raspberry Pi. I've already hooked up my uh, USB Western Digital 4 terabyte hard disk. And previously when I was playing around with the USB port on the router, and you'll see that in my first video, I set the volume to GPT. Yeah, there it is, Western Digital 4 terabytes or 3.64, you know how it is when you have something formatted, it gets smaller somehow. And they tell you to wipe that device. Basically, it's blowing away any volume that might be uh, contained on there. They actually advise that for GPT drives that you run this wipe procedure twice. So now that we've wiped the disk, we're going to establish a file system. So I'm going to hit, in file systems, I'm going to hit create. Then I select the device and I see my elements for terabyte drive. I'm just going to use their example in the documentation and label that volume as data. It's not really relevant in any way. It just shows up when you're looking at it in the GUI. So it makes it clear which volume you're talking about. It's just the name of the volume. Now this process here takes a really long time and you'll see that it wants to write out 29,808 entries and you can see it's going 100, 120 and so on. So we're going to crop this out. So I'll be right back. Okay. So that volume has finished formatting and we can see it's ext4. Now we have to mount that drive. That's so that when we reboot it will always be there. Seemed like it took a couple of clicks to get it to go. Okay, there we go. We need to apply a configuration change. Yeah, we see it here it's mounted and it wants me to apply the configuration change. And we know that'll take a long time. So I'm going to crop this out and we'll be right back. Okay, so our drive is mounted now. You can see mounted is yes. We can see it's the four terabyte drive. Now it's time to create shared folders. We do that under access rights management. I'm going to add a share. You give it a name and the path is automatically created in the name that you just created, but you could alter the path if you wish. And then you can configure the access permissions here, administrator read write, users read write, and others read only. I'm not going to allow guest access. In this particular document, they actually set guest access. Let's go ahead and build out another share. I'm just duplicating the folders and shares that are available on my server 2008 server right now, because I'll be copying that data over here. You can see I'm being prompted to apply the configuration change, but you can add as many shares as you like in this particular dialog without applying the configuration every time. That would take a long time. Going to use this to back up my video rendering workstation. That's not on the server 2008 server. I did want to try to get user home folders going. I didn't figure it out in the scope of this video. So we'll, we'll check that out later. Here I am applying the configuration changes. And then we have to configure SMB shares. Basically these shares are on the file system. And then we have to configure the SMB service so that these shares can be consumed by Windows clients. So that's coming up next. All right, so we go down into services, SMB, CIFS. We're going to enable SMB. I'm not going to change any of the parameters here. I try to enable user home directories, and when I go to save it, it says that uh, home directories aren't enabled. And uh, like I say, I, I kind of gave up in the scope of this video. It won't really be necessary. I don't have automatic home drive creation configured on my server 2008 server. My wife's profile is stored on my uh, server 2008 server, her documents, her desktop, and, and her other profile folders. So I'll be copying over her data and pointing her workstation to use these uh, network shares as 
the profile folder for her. You know, see there I get the error home directories because they're not enabled. So I'm just going to switch it off and uh, we'll go on from here. Okay, so we're going to select our first shared folder. Now I missed a step down here. You want to enable settings down below the extended attributes and store DOS attributes. I missed it on this one, but you'll see me circle back and fix it later on. Let's create more shares. You can see the configuration change ribbon across the top wants me to apply it, but I'm going to go ahead and add these shares as part of this step. So here I'm going to pick the share. Yeah, see there I realize, oh yeah, I got to switch extended attributes and DOS attributes on. So we'll add our next share and make sure to enable those. Get all of our pictures on here. Switch on extended attributes, store DOS attributes. So that's what you need to do to add um, SMB share. And I'll repeat this for the remaining shares and go back and fix up that one that I missed up on. Yeah, you can always go back and edit it. So here I'm editing that first one and switching those two features on, extended attributes and DOS attributes. Now we're going to apply those changes to the configuration. Okay, so we've configured shared folders and we've configured the SMB shares. Now I'm going to add a couple of users. My server 2008 server has a username administrator with a password and I want to make sure that gets added so I can connect to these shares from the server and copy data over. I also have a Jeff user and a Laurel user. So we'll create all the users we need. These users are already members of the users group in the system accounts area there. Okay, we've created all the users that we wanted to. So now we're going to apply the changes to the configuration. Okay, so we've configured shares, SMB service, added users. We're ready to browse this network attached storage device on our local PC. So let's check it out. Oh, we can see the Raspberry Pi is on the network. You see here, I eventually did get in, but if you can't get in, put a dot backslash in front of the username. So there's all my shares. We're ready to use this NAS. And as you can see, my server 2008 server, I'm copying the data over to that NAS. I'm just doing it over the network. I could have seeded that USB drive by attaching it directly to the server, but I really want to put this to the test so I can report success or fail to you there. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to check out part one as well. And thank you very much. Please subscribe to Shotoku Tech so little Jimmy can have legs, won't you? Thank you very much.